The Northrop P-61 was a night fighter designed to fulfill a largely overlooked gap in America's air defenses in the year prior to its entry into the Second World War. Ambitious and groundbreaking, the P-61 would be the first fighter aircraft designed to carry a radar and was also to be equipped with the state-of-the-art remotely controlled turret. However, the aircraft suffered numerous technical problems leading to many delays in its development and more than a few faults even making their way into operational aircraft. Despite its quirks, the plane proved to be popular with its pilots, effective in service, and far more capable in its mission than preceding American night fighters, while also proving itself effective in roles not envisioned at the time of its design. Hello, and welcome to another Plane Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host, Butane, and today we're looking at the P-61 Black Widow. With very little accomplished during the interwar period with regards to night fighter research in the U.S., the P-61 would be designed with the early lessons of the Second World War in mind. Thankfully for the Air Corps observers, the London Blitz would demonstrate exactly what was needed to face any threats from the air. They recognized that they needed a modern air force, which would cooperate with sophisticated detection and communication networks to form a comprehensive air defense system that would leave any attacker badly mauled, day or night. Brigadier General Tui Spots was the primary observer for RAF night fighting operations, and it was no coincidence that he later became chief of the Air Corps Material Division at Wright Field. While the British night fighter services were extremely crude at this point in the war, they presented a much better starting point for US planners than the virtually useless interwar experiments. Spots' efforts largely shaped the requirements for the Air Corps' night fighter, these being relayed to Northrop's chief of research, Vladimir Pavleka, while he was at Wright Field working on another project. Alongside a set of specifications, he was told that the plane would need to be a two-engine aircraft with a crew of two, a pilot and a radar operator, though the specifics of radar were not disclosed. At this time, Northrop was a new company and made for an obvious choice, as they had previously worked on a night fighter design for the British and were one of the only firms that were not already at capacity at the time. Soon, this new aircraft, designated the Air Corps Night Interceptor Pursuit Aeroplane, began to take shape. It would be powered by a pair of Whitney double wasp engines, carried in nacelles that would be connected by a twin boom tail and joined to the fuselage through the wings. It would carry a crew of three, a pilot, a gunner, and a radio operator who also doubled as a rear gunner. It would mount two turrets carrying four 50 caliber machine guns each and would be a large aircraft with a height of 13 feet and 2 inches, a length of 45 feet and 6 inches, a wingspan of 66 feet, and it would weigh 22,654 pounds, featuring the new Zaparka flaps. While this proposal bore many similarities to the later XP-61 prototype, much would change as the design was revised. While the design was promising, work was slow, and though Northrop had a prototype designed in January of 1941, it would be many more months until it was ready to fly, and years before it was ready for service. As a result, the aircraft would not be ready for the war to come, leaving most of the night fighting duties to stopgap designs, such as the converted A-20 bomber designated the P-70 and the British-supplied Bristol Beaufort. While American night fighter pilots had their first experiences in combat during 1942 and 1943, work on the new XP-61 continued. The program truly got underway in early 1942, after several contracts were issued. It was decided in February of 1942 that 410 aircraft would be procured and that delivery of the first 12 was to take place in April of 1943, with the final aircraft being handed over in January of 1944. However, contract negotiations saw the number of aircraft requested rise and fall significantly in the following months. In addition to deliveries to the USAAF, 50 P-61s were to be set aside for lent lease though this was later dropped due to a lack of RAF interest in the aircraft. The XP-61 was the first prototype, and in tests, was found to have numerous structural and technical faults relating mostly to its engines and armament. With many of these issues resolved, prototyping continued with a second prototype designated the YP-61. However, some issues remained, and several would make it into the first production models of the aircraft. 
Its greatest problems involved buffeting issues when the turret was rotated, its plus glass dome could deform under tropical conditions, and its rear lucite dome imploding when the aircraft maneuvered at high speed. In spite of its teething issues, the general flying characteristics earned the aircraft good marks from test pilots, exceeding Northrop's guaranteed performance by one mile per hour during speed tests, and was remarked upon by production project engineer Captain Fred Jenks as follows. The P-61 is an honest airplane. It has no mean tricks. In acrobatics such as loops, spins, lomons, and fast turns, it behaves as a pursuit plane should. Its stalling gestures are near perfect. The first P-61A rolled off the line in October of 1943 at Northrop's plant in Hawthorne, California. A public reveal later occurred at an Army-Navy show in Los Angeles in January of 1944. These aircraft were largely unchanged from the last P-61 pre-production aircraft, although this plane and the next 36 P-61As would be the only examples of the A model to be equipped with a remotely operated turret. The turret would be absent from the remaining 200 As and many of the succeeding B model, only to be reintroduced after a redesign. While the aircraft would largely resemble the early prototypes, there had been more than a few major reworks of the airframe. Most notably, the dropping of the ZAT flaps for near full span types with an added lateral control system which made use of spoilerons. While these did prove troublesome in testing, the faults had been ironed out and the system worked to the satisfaction of pilots. The final configuration made use of slot covers and seals for the spoileron slots that solved the vibration patterns and allowed for great lateral control for such a large aircraft while requiring little force on the part of the pilot. It was particularly useful during landings, where they were allowed for precise control on approach thanks to the automatic adjustment of the lateral control system with the flaps. This system was a major factor in making this fighter amongst the most maneuverable in the USAAF inventory, in spite of it being also the largest and heaviest. Pilots would find the P-61 a very maneuverable and forgiving aircraft to fly, and were particularly appreciative of its excellent landing characteristics, which made landing in the dark a far less daunting prospect. Likewise, they would also appreciate its heavy armament, even as though roughly half of the P-61s lacked the remotely operated turret, they could still make short work of any aircraft it came across with its four 20mm cannons. Its avionics were quite impressive, especially its SCR-720, which was state-of-the-art. Though pilots did have their complaints, as most found the view from the cockpit heavily obstructed by its frame, some felt the cockpit instrumentation was cluttered, and virtually all of them felt the aircraft lacking in acceleration and climb rate. Its greatest fault, however, lay in its crew layout, which placed the radar operator in a separate compartment, away from the other two. Should the intercom fail or the tail cone implode, the pilot would be without radar direction after the plane was guided to its target by a ground-based station. Though, in spite of its flaws, American night fighter pilots found it a welcome and much-needed improvement over the near-useless P-70 and the vulnerable but demanding Bristol Bullfighter. Ground crews were somewhat less enthusiastic about the aircraft than those who flew them. The plane represented a massive step up in terms of performance, but these improvements were matched by an increased technical complexity. The P-61 was a maintenance-intensive aircraft, and ground crews found the SCR-20 difficult to service, especially as spare parts for the aircraft were rare due to its comparatively small production run and issues with the radar's pressurized component being sensitive in tropical climates. Overall, the P-61 would present an aircraft with mixed but generally favorable characteristics. It was not until July of 1944 that the P-61s actually flew their first combat sorties over Europe, with several months prior to this being taken up by training, including joint exercises with the RAF and a race between the P-61A and a de Havilland Mosquito NF Mark Canteen. The latter was precipitated by a rumor that the USAAF was planning to replace the P-61 with the Mosquito. The race-off was an event long in the making, when its roots in the War Department's desire to purchase the Havilland Mosquitoes for use as reconnaissance aircraft and night fighters. In any case, the Mosquito was an essential part of ongoing RAF operations, and the British were tight-fisted when it came to supplies of the aircraft. 
This, however, did little to prevent a story from breaking out that claimed that P-61 squadrons would soon be replacing their planes for mosquitoes. The rumors soon filtered to the squadrons who were upset enough to propose a fly-off between the types. A demonstration was arranged on July 5, 1944 at RAF Station Hearn. The contenders were a P-61A and a Mosquito NF Mark 17, with the results being that the P-61 outclimbed and outturned the Mosquito between 5,000 and 20,000 feet. The race was anything but clear-cut, and it is extremely unlikely that it was just a fair competition that both sides took it part earnestly. Simply put, the RAF did not want to give the USAF any more mosquitoes than they absolutely had to, and were extremely motivated to throw the race. They had a great desire to ensure that they were better supplied with the only night fighter in Allied service at the time that could fly long-range missions into Germany. The results of the race were extremely suspicious, given just how clear the P-61's win seemed to be in comparison to the years of evaluations, which virtually always claimed that the Mosquito NF had the superior climb rate, and that the P-61 had superior maneuverability. Members of the 481st Night Fighter Training Group, who had flown both planes, came to the same conclusion, as did the AAF board, and even Colonel Winston Kratz, director of night fighter training and a major proponent of the P-61. His words perhaps best sum up the event. I'm absolutely sure the British were lying like troopers. I honestly believe the P-61 was not as fast as the Mosquito, which the British needed because by that time it was the one aeroplane that could get to Berlin and back without getting shot down. But come what may, the 61 was a good night fighter. In the combat game, you've got to be pretty realistic about these things. The first real test of the P-61 in Europe came in July of 1944, when they were pressed into service against a new threat, the Feistler 103 Flying Bomb or Buzz Bomb. The fast unmanned weapon required the P-61 to enter a slight dive to catch them, and while they flew straight and level, they proved a dangerous and challenging opponent. The bomb presented a small target, but its massive warhead was capable of damaging a pursuer, something Captain Tadis J. Spellis and Flight Officer Eutherios Lefty Elefteron would learn on the night of July 20th. Drawing in at 450 feet, Spellis detonated the bomb's payload, which violently shook his plane and caused serious damage to the plane's control surfaces and left much of the fuselage dented and perforated. At the end of July, the 422nd and 425th would make the trip across the channel to provide after-hours protection for the U.S. 1st and 3rd Armies, respectively. There, both squadrons would defend the Normandy beachhead as the Allies pushed forward into France. This period would largely inform the kind of fighting they would be doing for much of the campaign, intercepting lone German bombers and the occasional night fighter acting as an intruder, while also taking out alternative support missions. Shortly after the 422nd was deployed to the Sherbert Peninsula, they intercepted several Junker 88s, Dornier 217s, and Junker 188s as they attempted to harass Allied forces in the area. However, kills were difficult to confirm owing to the contested areas these aircraft went down in. This period also saw the P-61's first encounter with a German night fighter when Lt. Paul Smith and Lt. Robert Turney intercepted a BF-110G-4 on August 7, 1944. While Smith and Turney approached the enemy, they were soon spotted and found themselves in a turn fight. While the maneuverability of the P-61 allowed them to keep up with the enemy, the two planes would end up colliding. Despite the impact, both planes would end up returning home, each carrying paint from their opponent. The law in Luftwaffe lightning activity in the autumn and winter of 1944 meant that both British and American night fighter squadrons could shift to offensive operations, and thanks to newer models of the P-61A and B mounting additional hardpoints for fuels and bombs, they would have an exceptional tool for this task. Both the 422nd and the 425th NFS would provide a vital service to the beleaguered 101st Airborne Division at Bastogne, Belgium, where they were able to provide air cover and ground attack support day or night in weather that kept most other planes on the ground. The nightly air battles over the Ardennes took a similar but intensified form as the Luftwaffe mounted a desperate offensive, sortieing aircraft to attack Allied positions, drop supplies, and mounted a score of night fighter intruder missions. 
These intruder missions had aircraft loiter around enemy airfields and attack any aircraft attempting to take off or land. It was during this time that one of the greatest drawbacks of the P-61 made itself well known. It was a high-maintenance aircraft and replacement parts and planes were scarce. During the Battle of the Bulge, only 4 of the 422nd 16 P-61s were operational, and keeping these 4 planes serviceable was a round-the-clock effort of the highest importance. Apart from the just as limited number of A-20s, the P-61s were the only aircraft capable of flying in the terrible weather conditions of the battle. Supplies had to be found outside of the regular channels, and crews were rotated out of these aircraft that each flew up to four missions per night. Combined, the 422nd and 425th claimed a total of 115 trucks, 3 locomotives, 16 rail cars, 16 aircraft, and had disrupted Luftwaffe activities in the area. The actions of the 422nd would go on to earn them another distinguished unit citation, an accommodation from the commanding general of the 101st Airborne, Abba Stone. Throughout the night fighter service in Europe, encounters with enemy night fighters were fairly rare, as their squadrons flew ground attack missions in August against the Normandy beachhead and much later in December in support of the Ardennes counteroffensive. They flew BF 110 G4s, a few of the older Junker 88 Cs, and the newest German night fighter at the time, the Junker 88 G. While these aircraft flew with radar that had a much more limited range than the SCR-70 and were nearly useless at low altitude, their pilots were capable of putting up a much greater fight than those of the bomber and night attack squadrons. For example, the first encounter between a P-61 and a BF-110G-4 resulted in the latter being able to slip away after a collision, despite holding a clear disadvantage in speed and maneuverability. The P-61s of the 422nd and 425th would find these night fighters significantly more challenging opponents than the medium bombers and transport aircraft they usually encountered. The Battle of the Bulge would mark the apex of the NFS's activity in the European theater. The remainder of the European campaign would consist mostly of ground attack and intruder missions, as fuel shortages left most of the Luftwaffe grounded. Both the 422nd and 425th would commit themselves to groundwork against the usual targets, truck convoys and rail lines, as Tactical Air Command ordered a cessation of defensive air patrols, instead focusing on general offensive operations. In this role, the P-61 proved exceptional, despite the design never being intended for such use, with the initial models not even possessing bomb racks. The P-61 was a godsend to the Pacific Night Fighter Squadrons, who had long been forced to rely on the inadequate P-70, and with the exception of a few field-modified aircraft, radarless P-38s. Starting from early 1944, the various night fighter squadrons in the Pacific Theater of Operations would begin receiving P-61s and phasing out their long obsolete P-70s. Unlike Europe or the Mediterranean, the operation in the Pacific would not proceed at the pace of a gradual front line that needed to be supported, but rather saw the squadrons deployed to newly constructed airstrips in support of larger amphibious squadrons, which were targeted by raiders. Conditions were poor and extremely hard on airmen and planes alike, which brought unique challenges not known to those in the European theater. In the words of Sergeant Harold Cobb of the 421st Flight Squadron, Night fighting is not glamorous, but it is specialized in every degree, especially in the Seven League Boots Island Hopping War in the Pacific. Pilots must be able to take off and land without strip lights, and on fields which are so new that construction is still in progress and the CBs are still working. Night fighter pilots in the Pacific faced horrible conditions which outstripped those in Europe, the Mediterranean, and Central Asia in their ability to wreak havoc on men and equipment alike. The prepared airfields were often built under difficult circumstances and challenging geography. The sea bees often had to work with coral beds, wetlands, and jungles that proved time-consuming to develop into useful airstrips, often leaving little time and resources for improving the living conditions at these airfields. These conditions were also felt by the sensitive radar systems of the aircraft, especially the pressurized containers which contained many of the system's vital components. They had a tendency to depressurize, which resulted in electrical arcing at altitude, disabling the whole system. 
Earlier models of the P61A, which still had the plastic red dome, also encountered trouble in the tropical heat and sun, as the nose of the aircraft would often soften and deform, which would impact the movement of the SCR-720 scanner. In addition to the reflective white paint added to the nose, crews would fasten sunshields while grounded to protect the red dome and the tropical heat. As was the case with the European squadrons, supplies of replacement parts and aircraft were scarce, and in a unique twist in the Pacific, the improper packing of engines resulted in the loss of 400 R2800s to corrosion. Combat readiness suffered as a result. The 421st considered a good day should six of their aircraft be operational during their operations from their later airbase at Tacloban in the Philippines. Japanese night raiders were a fixture of the war in the Pacific since their campaigns over Guadalcanal. Their targets ranged from troop positions to airfields, though they would increasingly target shipping at night as the war drew on. Despite being significantly less experienced with the use of ground-based and airborne radars than the Germans, Japanese aviators and mission planners consistently demonstrated the ability to develop effective countermeasures and tactics to American night fighters. Japanese signals intelligence services would also prove extremely effective and were able to determine the presence of enemy night fighters in areas without radar coverage by monitoring radio transmissions, and were even able to track the position of P-61s by their IFFs. They would also successfully employ chaff on a number of occasions, though to decreasing effect, as the U.S. Army began to employ more advanced centimetric search radars that were less vulnerable to it. In addition to this, they would also employ seaplanes to get the attention of night fighters, and once they had drawn them away from the raider's target, they would land on the water surface or return home at low altitude. This tactic appeared to have been used against the P-61s of the 421st Night Fighter Squadron while they were at Tacloban in the Philippines, and to good effect as the loiter time of the P-61 was rather low, and they were often forced to return home after several of these non-encounters. The P-61C would be developed to largely fulfill the requests of most of the pilots who had flown P-61As and Bs. The design sought to add two major features, more powerful turbocharged engines to provide better high-altitude performance and a higher climb rate, as well as a set of air brakes. The air brakes would be designed by AAF's right field staff in conjunction with Northrop. The design first incorporated on a P-61A test aircraft, which was nearly lost after a portion of the air brake had sheared off the aircraft and nearly sent it out of control. The final design proved satisfactory and took the form of a two-part slotted panel with halves above and below either wing. While the P-61C came far too late to take part in the Second World War, it would go on to make major contributions to meteorological research and aeronautic safety in the post-war thunderstorm project. The project began with the passing of H.R. 164 in January of 1945, which authorized and directed the Weather Bureau to conduct a study on the causes and characteristics of thunderstorms in the interest of aviation safety. The bill would also authorize the appropriations needed for a study and authorize the cooperation of other departments for assistance. The finalized research plan caused for a vertical stack of five aircraft to make passes through thunderstorms as they drifted over a network of meteorological recording stations in order to document the conditions within the storm. The Army Air Force would provide several P-61Cs and its derivative, the F-15A, for this purpose, as they were designed to withstand strong maneuvering loads and were judged strong enough to quite literally weather the storm. These aircraft would be modified for the purpose, with war crime equipment being removed and meteorological research equipment being installed in its place. The aircraft were prepared at NACA's Langley Field with the equipment necessary to monitor turbulence and vertical air currents. For the test, the planes entered thunderstorms at altitude differences of 5,000 feet, with the highest aircraft being at 25,000 feet. No storms were avoided, no matter how violent. The project first began around Orlando, Florida in 1946, before later on moving to Wilmington, Ohio the following year. These locations were chosen on the basis of the frequency of thunderstorms and the nearby Air Force installations which had the radars needed to support the project. 
The project would see the P-61s fly through 76 storms for 1,362 fly-throughs, during which they collected vital data that would help pave the way for safer air travel during the post-war civil aviation boom, and were used to build a foundational study for thunderstorm research. And that's it for the illustrious career of the P-61 Widow, America's wartime night fighter aircraft. If you liked this Plane Encyclopedia Voice article, please like, subscribe, hit the bell so that we can be notified when new content comes out. As always, keep us in your sights.